Hi, this is Miklos Mayer. I am a photo tour guide in Budapest, Hungary, and in this video I will be reviewing the brand new Nikon Z50 mirrorless camera together with its kit lenses, the 16 to 50 mm and the 50 to 250 mm zoom lenses. I will specifically review the ergonomics and feel of the camera the autofocus system with the face and eye tracking, the dynamic range of its RAW files, the video quality and autofocus during video, the night photographic capability and the sharpness of the kit lenses. First of all, let's run through the main specs of the Nikon Z50. Uh, wait, in Europe we say Nikon. Anyway, the Nikon Z50 is Nikon's first mirrorless camera with an APS-C sensor in it. I'm very happy that Nikon did not chase the megapixels and they just put a 20 megapixel sensor into the camera. I think that's enough for the majority of the users. The Nikon Z50 looks almost exactly like the full frame Nikon Z6, is just a little bit smaller. The Z50 is really small, even with the kit lens on it. It's exactly five inches wide and 2.7 inches thick, and it weighs exactly one pound. Wait, 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 sorry, I got the specs wrong. It's 0 0.99 pounds. Thank God Nikon decided to use the exact same Z mount as they use on their full frame cameras. I think this is something that Canon got really wrong when they decided to go with a different lens mount for their APS-C sensor mirrorless cameras. Of course, to make this camera cheaper, Nikon obviously had to leave out a few things that can be found in its full frame brothers. There are three main differences between the Nikon Z50 and the Z6. First of all, the Nikon Z50 does not have an in-body image stabilization, so the sensor is not stabilized. But to compensate for that, the kit lenses, they all have very good image stabilization. More on this later. Also, I'm glad to see that the Nikon Z50 accepts SD cards and not those weird XQD cards like the Nikon Z6 does. And finally, the Z50 does not have that sophisticated video specs, but it's still pretty impressive nonetheless. In comparison to its direct competitor, the Canon M6 Mark II, the Nikon Z50 does have a built-in viewfinder, unlike the Canon, where you have to buy that separately. I've been using the Nikon Z50 for two weeks now, and I've been very satisfied with the viewfinder. Even with my glasses, I can see it very well, and it's just huge. It feels just as big as a full-frame DSLR's viewfinder. I just love it. Also, it is quite accurate in terms of exposure. Though the Nikon Z50 is really small, the grip feels really good and the materials used on the camera give it a high quality feeling. It feels like a proper camera, not like an electronic gadget that has a camera shape. <laughs> I hope that you know what I mean. One thing that I have to get used to is that my pinky finger is always hanging loose under the camera, but I will probably fix this by buying a specifically designed button plate or something like that. Now let's have a look at how the buttons of the Nikon Z50 are laid out. It's got two control dials, one in the front and one on the top back corner of the camera. I think these are placed well, although people with big hands may feel it too small. The mode dial is on the top of the camera and I'm worried to see two user customizable modes here. Also, here's the lever with which you can switch between photo and video mode. I think it's a really good idea to separate the two modes with an actual physical switch. This way you will never accidentally record a video. You can change the exposure compensation by pressing the plus minus button on the top and rotating one of the dials. And it's almost the same with ISO speed. You have to keep the ISO button pressed and with the front dial you can switch between auto ISO turned on and off and then turn the back dial to change the ISO speed. By the way, if you are not familiar with auto ISO, I highly recommend that you check out my video. I'm gonna link it up there or down below. Next to the lens mount, there are two customizable function buttons which are placed a bit funnily so I have never used it in the two weeks. Now let's jump to the best part of the body, the tiltable touch screen. The screen is really vivid and bright and the sharpness is excellent. Everything is touch sensitive here, so you can just swipe through the menu and of course you can set the AF points with a tap or you can even let the camera release the shutter as well when you tap. 
and it's the same easy when viewing the photos. It almost feels like a phone. It's very responsive and recognizes all those finger movements. For example, with double tapping, you can jump into 100% magnification and back. This is the first camera ever where you can tilt the screen 180 degrees downwards. So yes, this camera is capable of shooting selfies and you can see yourself in the screen. And this is a good news for video makers and vloggers as well. Now I can see myself in the screen and I can put a mic into the hot shoe. But in real life, this setup is very hard to use for two reasons. First, if you put a normal sized tripod plate on the camera, it will not allow the screen to tilt downwards. Second, if you manage to put it on the tripod, the tripod head will most probably cover the screen anyway. Anyway, I think this solution is way better than having no articulation at all and probably it will be enough for most of the people who just would like to have selfies with their cameras. On the right side of the screen there are hidden buttons. Yes, they are actually buttons, they are touch sensitive parts of the screen and you can press them. On the bottom of the camera you will find the battery door and this is where the single SD card slot is located as well. I found it a bit challenging to pull the card out because there is not much space there for my fingers. Alright, alright, enough of the camera buddy, let's jump to the autofocus performance. The Nikon Z50 has 209 face detection autofocus points that cover almost the entire frame and it has face and eye detection as well. I can tell you that it finds the faces and eyes pretty accurately and tracks them pretty well. One thing that many people noted, the IAF and face detection only works in auto AF point selection mode, so it does not work in any other AF point area settings. So you just can't limit the area where the autofocus will be looking for the faces or the eyes. But with the joystick you can move between eyes or between faces, at least there's that. I would say that overall the Nikon's autofocus system is on par with the Canon's but is not nearly as sophisticated as the Sony's autofocus system. The Nikon Z50 also has a lock on AF feature. By pressing the OK button that yellow square pops up and if I'm in continuous AF mode and initiate the AF the camera will lock focus on whatever the yellow square was at. You can move the yellow square around with the arrows and you are supposed to do with your thumb which I find quite uncomfortable. I wish Nikon implemented the same thing what Canon did because on the Canons you can just tap on the screen and the AF can be moved around. I think that's a bit more comfortable. The Nikon Z50 has several continuous drive modes. First there's a low speed one where you can set the speed from 1 to 4 frames per second. Then there's the high mode where it shoots a bit faster and there's the extended high mode where it can shoot 11 frames per second. That's pretty good. So I've tested the lock on autofocus in this high speed mode. I asked my son to run towards me as I was taking photos of him with the 50 to 250 millimeter kit lens. I have to tell you that the focus tracker stayed on his face all the time and out of 58 shots I had only one out of focus. The rest of the pictures were tag sharp. Then I pushed the AF even further. There was a dog coaching lady nearby and I asked her if I could take photos of the dogs. I was quite surprised that the Z50 often found the faces of the dogs, sometimes it even found their eyes. But even when it didn't find the face, the AF set the focus always on the dogs and not on the grass. And then came the real test. The dogs running towards me. They were so fast that I often couldn't even keep them in the viewfinder. You can see the astonishment on my face here. Therefore, the first few shots usually turned out pretty well, but when the camera lost focus because of me being lame, from there on it just focused on the grass. But I can't really blame the camera here, because these things happened in a split of a second. Still, even with these fast dogs, I came away with some keeper shots. But I have to emphasize that these dogs were very very small and they were running fast so it's just not fair to judge the AF performance of the Nikon Z50 
by this only. As I've shown you earlier, with humans it did a great job. Just like other Nikon cameras, the Z50 also has the I button which brings up the most important settings. And of course you can customize in the menu what should appear here. And more importantly, the I menu is different in the video mode. So you can assign completely different things to appear here that are more important when recording a video. I also tested the Nikon Z50 from a night photographer's point of view, well, because mainly I do night photography. So I went out to some of the vantage points in Budapest, Hungary and took some test photos there to test the dynamic range of the Nikon Z50. I like to arrive early on, on the scenes, so here are a few shots before sunset. I used the 16 to 50 millimeter kit lens here. This is the Matthias Church shot at 20 millimeter at f5.6 and as you can see it's pretty sharp even at the edges. And this is the Hungarian Parliament building shot from almost the same location at 50 millimeter f9. When checking the details at 100% view I think it's sharp enough but obviously it's not stellar as most kit lenses get softer on the long end. And as you can see I already acquired some nice dust spots on the sensor. Then I kept moving on and there was some beautiful light on the palace of the Hungarian president and here I took a photo at 16mm and f7.1. You can see that the camera automatically corrected uh, for the lens distortions so the lines are straight. And then the night fell and I started to use the 50 to 250 millimeter f4.5 to 6.3 kit tele lens as well. This lens was definitely a, a surprise for me. I wasn't expecting this good performance. For example, here's a shot of the Chambridge and the Danube at f5.6 at 66 millimeter setting. That is the equivalent of 100 millimeter on a full frame. Look how sharp it is. As I stopped down the lens, I observed that sharpness drops down above f8, which is quite typical for tele lenses. So for the rest of the night, I just used it on f8. For example, I zoomed all the way to 250 millimeter and took photos of the Budapest Eye and the St. Stephen's Cathedral. It came out pretty sharp, look at the details. This is another shot at 250 millimeter of the Palace of Arts and the National Theatre of Hungary. For such a cheap lens, the result is just fine. Or here's another shot of the Hungarian Parliament at f8. Here I really liked the self timer feature because you can select the delay time from 2 seconds to 20 seconds and you can also set the number of frames to be taken. So I took 5 photos here, each 2 seconds long and then I stacked the light rails together in Photoshop and this is the final image I got. I really like how the light rails are now one continuous line. Let me stop here real quick. I processed these photos using my Lightroom presets designed for night photography. I have a super simple workflow to process photos like this. I have a set of presets where I adjust the white balance first and then with another set of presets I adjust the levels. And that's it. Most of the photos you see in this video were processed with just two clicks. You can head over to my website and download this night photography Lightroom preset package over there. Now let me also show you a photo that was taken with the 16 to 50 millimeter kit lens. This shot of the parliament was taken at f13 and as you can see it's pretty sharp. I also went out the next night but I didn't have a tripod with me because I had to give it to my guest so I took some handheld shots at high ISO speeds. I have to tell you that I was really impressed with both the image stabilizer in the kit lenses and also with the high ISO performance of the Nikon Z50. With the 50 to 250 millimeter lens at 50 millimeter setting, which is the equivalent of 75 millimeter on a full frame, I could safely take photos at 1 15th of a second shutter speed and come away with tech sharp pictures. This photo is also a good example of high ISO. I took this shot at ISO 800 and I deliberately underexposed it to preserve details in the highlights. So in Lightroom I had to push up the exposure by one and a half stops and as you can see the noise 
is pretty well controlled. Then to push the boundaries even further I zoomed with the lens to 145 millimeter which is equivalent of 200 millimeter and thanks to the optical image stabilization I had sharp photos at 1 25th of a second. This is like three and a half stops advantage in terms of shutter speed so the image stabilization in the 50 to 250 millimeter lens works really well just as advertised. This shot was taken at ISO 1600 and again was pushed up one and a half stops in Lightroom and you can see that the noise is surprisingly well controlled here. Don't forget that this is ISO 1600 pushed up one and a half stops which is roughly the equivalent of ISO 4000. And I did not have to apply noise deduction on any of these high ISO shots. I have to tell you that for most of these shots I use automatic AF area autofocus and most of the time it did a good job except when it didn't and there were some occasions when it didn't focus well. Like here you can see some frames that were defocused and then the last one it was sharp. So in these cases I had to switch to manual focusing. I've already made a video about the manual focusing technique. If you haven't used manual focusing yet make sure to watch that. I will link it up there or down below. Now, talking about manual focusing on the Nikon Z50, I was quite surprised to find out that the Nikon Z50 does not have an automatic focus magnification feature to aid manual focusing, but don't worry, you can still magnify into the line view, you just have to press the plus magnify button and then you can safely focus manually. On the other hand, the Nikon Z50 has focus peaking and it's quite customizable. You can pick the color of the peaking and the intensity. The nice scenes are perfect to test the exposure latitude or dynamic range of the Z50. This test measures how much the shadows can be brightened up before having too much noise. For those of you not into night photography this is crucial for us because mostly the details are in the highlights so we have to expose for the highlights but in this case all the rest of the frame will be pretty dark so we have to push the darker areas up in Lightroom or Photoshop. Now let's see how the Z50 holds up here. So this is my original exposure and then I made several underexposed shots. This is the most extreme one this one I have to push up by five stops and this one I have to push by four stops. So here are the results side by side at 100% magnification. You can see that the Nikon Z50 could easily take three stops of exposure pushing and not much noise there. At four stops you can see some color noise coming out and of course a lot more comes out at five stops. But this can be quite effectively removed with the color noise reduction slider in Lightroom. Just for fun, here's the full frame and twice as expensive Canon EOS R in the same test. You can see that the Nikon Z50 clearly beats them. I did some testing under the stars as well with the 16 to 50 millimeter lens. The stars, as they are quite small light sources, they bring out all kinds of optical errors from any lens, so this is a very demanding test. I set 16 millimeter focal length and pointed the camera to the north and set a shutter speed around 8 seconds. By the way, on my website there's a super useful calculator for how long shutter speeds you can use for the stars without leaving star trails. I'm gonna link the calculator down below. As you can see at wide open f3.5 it's pretty sharp in the center but there's quite much coma and astigmatism in the corners. Of course it gets better when stopped down but you are unlikely to shoot stars at f5.6. I think for a kit lens the 16 to 50 performs okay under the starry skies but of course don't expect stellar performance here. I also shoot a lot of time lapses so I'm very happy to see a time lapse program built in. It can either make a video in the camera or just give you the individual photos. I will test the time lapse feature of this camera in another video later on. Now let's jump onto the video performance of the Nikon Z50. For me the main reason to buy the Z50 was its video performance. You can tell from the specs and ergonomics that Nikon takes video performance very seriously nowadays. And yes the Nikon Z50 can record 4K video at 30 frames per second without cropping in so it's reading the whole sensor. Also just like any other proper camera it has 24 frame per second frame rate built in unlike the Canons. 
As you might know, 24 frames per second is the industry standard for cinematography. Also, the Nikon Z50 can record at 120 frames per second in full HD. And the best thing is that the phase detection autofocus works even at 120 frames per second, so you will have the same snappy AF when recording slow-mo videos. You can see how well it tracked my face. Talking about the autofocus in video, at first I wasn't really satisfied with the speed of it. It focused well, but not fast enough for my taste. Luckily, in the Z50 there are AF options for the video as well. So here I set the AF tracking sensitivity to high and also the AF speed to fast. After I set these, I was very pleased with how it tracked and focused on my face. These shots were recorded completely automatically with auto AF mode, so I did not have to press anything, it just focused well. But for videos when the subject is standing still, like here, I wouldn't set a high AF sensitivity because then the camera would just refocus again and again for really nothing. I was also quite pleased with the picture quality for both full HD and 4K resolutions. Unfortunately, there are no log profiles in the Z50, but there's a video profile called flat and this can be color graded best. So I recorded this scene in this flat profile and this is how it looks unedited and this is how it looks with a little bit of editing in Premiere Pro. The other thing that indicates that this is not a professional videographer camera is that the Nikon Z50, although it has a microphone jack, it does not have a headphone jack. When recording digital video, the rolling shutter or the so-called jello effect can be very annoying. You know, this is where verticals get slanted when you pan the camera horizontally. Luckily for the Nikon Z50, the rolling shutter is almost non-existent in full HD. Here's a freeze frame from a panning movement, but it was a bit noticeable in 4K. Here I also tested out how well the image stabilizer works. This feature is specifically for video and when selected it cuts a bit into the frame so it can digitally stabilize the footage. So to test this I just started to walk towards the cathedral. It did an okay job but I just don't like the warping effect so I would just turn this off. To summarize it, I think the Nikon Z50 is an excellent APS-C mirrorless camera packed with lots of pro features. Although it's small, it feels pretty good in the hands and the excellent viewfinder and tiltable screen makes it even more pleasant to use. The image quality, the dynamic range, the high ISO performance is virtually the same or even better than what the competition offers. I think the Nike Z50 is best for photographers who travel a lot and they are very concerned about weight and size and it's also ideal for people who are just jumping into the mirrorless world. So guys, what do you think of this camera? Did Nikon make a good move? Let me know in the comments. If you'd like to see some full resolution photos to pixel peep at, head over to my website. There's going to be a link under the video and you can download these photos. Also, if you liked my video, you can subscribe here or down below and see you soon.